Hello leaders, uh, you're welcome to Liveline Leadership Conference 2014. Um, today we're going to be having a very interesting session. Uh, it's a discussion session with Dr. Akinyemi Akinrimade. Dr. Akinyemi is one of the um, leaders in Kenneth Egin Rema, Nigeria. And it's, it's been someone that has inspired me so much and several other people with his um, leadership um, skills. Um, Dr. Akinyemi, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to have this interview with you. You know, when I talk, when I spoke to you about this, um, you know, take, you know, invite you to Lagos for the interview session. You told me how your itinerary was so busy and you couldn't make it. And you start to suggest that we meet here in Tabo uh, International Airport in Johannesburg. You know, and you are just coming from Nigeria right now and traveling to East London. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm well, glad to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Kinyan. Um The first question I would like to ask you is, how would you describe um, leadership in Christianity? Wow. Thank you very much. That is an exciting question, uh, something I'm particularly passionate about. Leadership in the body of Christ and in Christianity has been viewed in different ways over, over the years. But the words that were captured, uh, think about uh, the concept of sacrifice, and the concept of servanthood, which seems very, very unrelated to the concept of leadership as we know it, because a leader is supposedly supposed to be someone who is out there doing things, directing people, and so on and so forth. But from scriptures, from the life of Jesus, who is the ultimate leader, and who we should be patterning our leadership after, from the life of the apostles, and from what we see in... Um, leaders, contemporary or past leaders who've left a strong legacy, will say leadership is in the lines of sacrificial servant leadership. That is the model of leadership I believe we should have in the body of Christ. Um, have you always been a leader or did you learn leadership skills while growing up? A uh, very interesting question. Maybe I'll try and just link it to the first one. You know, when we look at the scriptures, uh, the Bible says a lot about this. One of the key scriptures that we see is found in the book of Acts chapter 20, where Jesus, I mean, where, where, uh, where Paul said to the leaders in the church at that time, he says, Take heed to the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, that you feed the body of Christ that he purchased with his own blood. So you see the fundamental concept of leadership there is that the overseer or the leader is supposed to tend the flock like a shepherd, feed the flock, see to the flock. So that's sacrifice, that's servanthood, that's also leadership. With regards to my own life, um, whether I've always been a leader, I will say that uh, I've always been someone who's passionate about changing situations, being dissatisfied with things that were not working right, being dissatisfied with dysfunctional situations. I didn't always know I was a leader. I just found myself doing things or getting involved. But eventually, I started to understand that this was actually leadership. Other people recognized it, and then later on, I started to recognize it myself. And once I started to recognize it, and I started to make um, intentional efforts to improve and develop my leadership, yes, then I was able to embrace it much further. So indeed, there may have been, uh, there were definitely many things that shows that I was leading, but I didn't always know that I was a leader in that sense. Uh, Dr. Aki, I mean, you talked about, you know, displaying the attributes of a leader before occupying several leadership positions. So I would like to ask you, how can a believer lead without a title? Or how can a believer, you know, display leadership attributes without occupying a position? Indeed, as we said, uh, many people misunderstand what leadership is. Uh, typically in this day and age, people assume that they lead because they have a title and uh, a name or they have a, uh, they have a name or a badge or a business card or something or a job description. But that doesn't make you a leader. According to John Maxwell, leadership largely is influence. Leadership is the ability to influence people, to move people and resources to achieve a desired outcome. That desired outcome is determined by the person who places in leadership. 
So if we look at the body of Christ or ministry, for example, so God is the ultimate boss. He's the one who determines things. He's the one who has a desired outcome in mind. And he's the one moving things around. So leadership in that context will simply mean you are able to influence people, influence resources towards achieving that outcome. You don't need a title to do that. A title helps, no doubt, at times, in recognizing the authority and getting people to be able to cooperate better. But largely, if you work on your leadership, you're influencing people, you're able to move resources, move people along a continuum towards an outcome. That's leadership. And you don't need a title with that. That is the biggest problem. Everyone is trying to get a title, but you don't need a title to lead. Um, I was already leading so much, as I said, without any title attached to it. Okay. God desires that many believers lead great movements in our generation, but many of them are not expressing the leader in them because they do not yet occupy leadership positions. What are the practical steps that believers can take to come out of this quagmire? I'm very passionate about this, especially when it comes to younger people. And, but you can start leading at any age, at any time. You can, that's one lesson I learned. You can intentionally increase your leadership. Leadership is about capacity, largely. One of the problems that I do see as I work with young people over time is we want to occupy positions of authority. Not understanding that positions of authority is or should be a recognition of leadership. So it's not the other way. It's not positions of authority and then leadership. It's leadership earning you the right to occupy positions of authority. So what do you need? The first thing is to build capacity in yourself. So if you are leading, you need to build the capacity to lead. And how do you do that? There are simple ways. I will say study. Get some study and get some training behind you. So study could be personal and training could be through an institution or so. The other thing is to develop capacity through a word that is almost uh, in some circles it's like a swear word. Discipleship. What do I mean by discipleship? Discipleship entails the concept of understudy, the concept of apprenticeship. In other words, you key yourself with people or a person within an organization or institution that allows you to develop the skills and build capacity, make mistakes and lead under a protective environment where your decisions do not have catastrophic consequences either for yourself or for institution or for other people. For example, um, you're a leader, you're developing capacity, you, you're an apprenticeship, you are learning, you are developing strength of character, you are building your capacity, you are learning different situations by observing people who are in authority or who are in other positions of leadership. You can learn to do things. They give you and they delegate authority to you from time to time. You may make mistakes, but because there is, a, there is somebody else who is teaching you, who is mentoring you, who is discipling you, your actions are not able to have catastrophic consequences for yourself when you make mistakes or for other people because there's someone else. Now that allows you to build capacity when you add the study, when you add the training. A lot of young people just want to get out there and start doing things. There's no training. Um, so there's a lot of dysfunction. Training is not a swear word. The time spent, Kenneth Hagin said, sp time spent in preparation is never wasted time. Even a building, a building doesn't just rise overnight. The foundations run deep. And deeper the foundations, the stronger the building you're able to build. So I advise young people, build capacity. When opportunity comes, they said opportunity plus preparation equals success. And that's the pattern we see with Jesus. He chose disciples, walked with them, mentored them, taught them for three and a half years. And we see the result today. Billions and billions of people serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Akiyemi, you talked about you know, delegated authority. What happens in a situation where you are delegated an authority for an area you believe is not your calling as a believer? Um, that's part of something that we call process. The making of a leader involves process. At times, because you are under delegated authority means 
you might be asked to function in a capacity that you feel is not your calling. But remember, you are in apprenticeship, you are in training, you are in development. So what you learn there, you might feel initially, this is not related to what I'm called to, but there are things you will learn and develop within yourself that will ultimately help you function better in the place of your primary assignment. Now, God has an intelligent way of moving things around. So you find a person who is a pastor, who had to do a stint in the mining industry, in the finance industry, working with people, thousands of miners, learning to resolve strike situations and so on. Later on becomes a pastor of a mega church. Becomes much easier that, wow, the people skills, the management skills he learned while he was slaving there and thought, oh God, what am I doing? Is this the ministry? That becomes immediately useful later on. So it's never wasted time. There is a situation, of course, if the Lord intervenes and overrules and you say this is an absolute no-no i believe what you should do it's part of the process Div discuss politely with the person who is in authority over you explain the reason why you have reservations express the fact that you are willing and you have willingness to get the job done find out if it is possible to give you some other responsibility which may be better suited to your skills and abilities but by all means accept the opportunity to serve so that the fact is you're not saying no I don't want to do this I don't want to do it because I don't uh, it's not my choice but rather you're willing to serve in any capacity because you're building your own uh, leadership qualities and eventually God will move you around and give you opportunity to do what he has called you to do having prepared you appropriately for that so I have no problem at all in someone asking me to serve I've done anything name it in the body of Christ. I've cleaned the floor, swept, dusted chairs, been the pastor, preached, set up the media, pulled the cables. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. The first job I had, you know, while volunteering, you know, I had a dream, for example, to be involved with media at a strategic level in the ministry. And the first opportunity I had to participate in media, I showed up in a suit and they said to me, go and do the cable bashing, go pick up the wires behind the cameraman. And you just got to start right from there. And many years later, I found myself heading up and setting up the media department in a multi-site church of about 20-something branches, about 8,000 members. And if I didn't learn those things initially, there would be no way I would be able to function in that capacity. Thank you. It is generally believed that every leader was once a follower or is a follower to some leader so what do you do as a leader if you um, you know are following a very difficult and oppressive boss well you see we cannot choose the circumstances and situations we find ourselves many times in life we can however choose our response to many of the situations Many times we tend to be reactionary rather than proactive. So in other words, it's never about the other person. It's always about you. And in any situation, no matter how difficult or oppressive, you can always ask and say, what am I learning from this? How am I becoming a better person at this? How can I turn this situation around to better serve the organization, to better serve the Lord, to better improve myself. So whatever situation you find outside, you've got to turn it inside first. Uh, a great person once said, you might relocate from a, a city, an organization, a church or something, but the interesting thing is you carry yourself there. So you're going to duplicate yourself anywhere. So many times it's not about other people. However, you have situations where you have difficult, oppressive bosses. What does the Bible have to say about this? I would say, the Bible says serve anyway. Because the Bible says to be in submission to those who are in authority over you. It's the principle of authority. It's not the person. I would say be faithful to the Lord. Keep serving. Maintain a quiet, teachable spirit. In the right circumstances, the Bible even talks about people who are very cantankerous, being won over because of your quiet and peaceable nature. At times, you will never win them over. Remember what the Bible says. It says, do all things as unto the Lord, not as unto them. Your reward, your succor, your promotion, 
does not come from man it comes from the Lord serve during that time do what you need to do soon enough the Holy Spirit will move you he will not going to leave you in an oppressive situation forever I've been there many times and um, and sometimes I feel I have just got to get out of here and things like that but many times you short circuit God's process the interesting thing is this walk with the Holy Spirit he will tell you when it's time to move he will tell you when it's time to go to the next assignment don't short circuit or jeopardize God's process simply because you are unable to take the heat they said if you can't take the heat get out of the kitchen so ministry can be tough leadership is even worse because Bible says that your you know your judgment is worse so take it as a process serve God as you're serving the person God will reward you God will honor you it will move you strategically eventually to a place where you're able to serve uh, with fresh air that's what I believe Dr. Kim, just before this um, interview, we had some discussions and you mentioned the fact that you've learned a lot in the, uh, you know, over the years about leadership and you are still learning. Um, so what are the, some of the things that you have regretted doing as a leader in the past? Oh, wow. Many, many. There's an adage in my language that says, no matter the number of new clothes a young person has, he can never have as many rags as an older person. Uh, time and experience teaches you a lot. The easiest way to learn, first of all, is from the Word of God. So if you go into the Word of God, you will learn not to make the mistakes others have made. But then you learn from getting your hands dirty and being there in the trenches. There are many things I've done in leadership that I've learned from and um, there were big mistakes. One of the things is, um, I would say, many of the things re resolve or revolve around people's skills. People's skills have to be learned. How to relate with your peers, how to relate with those you are leading, and how to relate with those in authority over you. For example, I'll just give this one and say there are times when I've been right, but the spirit in which I conveyed my rightness was wrong because the leader was not impressed or happy about a situation. And um, all I did was to justify the fact that I was right in the situation when I could have diffused the whole situation. Simply for example, by hearing the spirit of the leader, apologizing for the situation and say, what would you have me do to rectify this? And then I will have diffused the problem instead of leading to a potential conflict between the leader and myself. Because I was under delegated authority in that circumstance. And then at times, when you are even the one in whatever capacity of authority, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not to develop the next level of leadership. Leadership is not about yourself. Ultimately, you must take the continuum from success to significance to legacy. So legacy is about empowering the next generation. From the minute you start, you have to build teams around you and beginning to inspire and empower the next generation. So those are big lessons in leadership I've made over the years. Being a doer rather than a leader. So we, we like to do. So I might be the person who is able to do something best. But as a leader, your job moves from simply being the one who is doing it, and so to speak, to those who is providing the resources and the opportunity for those around you to do the job. Therefore, they have self-fulfillment. They are happy. They are getting fulfillment in their calling. The job is getting done. And you as a leader, you are doing your job of empowering the next generation. Wow. Yes, thank you. Wow, I like that phrase, inspiring the next generation. You know, you said several powerful keywords today. So if there are three keywords you would like, you know, every leader listening to you to always remember, what are those three keywords? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> but I'll say, I'll say over the years I've got to learn that um, three keywords. One will be integrity. Integrity revolves around character, it revolves around ethics, it revolves around having a moral compass, it revolves around strength, tenacity, stability, ability to continue. So integrity is very important. Another word that I'll talk about is servanthood. Servanthood involves humility, it involves a willingness to a willingness to take the attention away from yourself to other people 
a willingness to allow other people to shine, to share in the glory or to take the glory ultimately, so to speak. Humility involves knowing that it's not about you, it's about God yeah. and things like that. And then the, the third word I will say is empowerment. Mm -hmm. Leadership, a, a great person once said, if you are leading and no one is following, you are just taking a walk. Leadership is always about people. You have to be empowering, not just inspiring. I like that to inspire people, but you have to empower the next generation because God has a big mandate and we are part of that mandate. It's not about us ultimately. It's about getting people to do. In fact, the ultimate scripture, one of the ultimate scriptures on leadership in Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says God gave ministry gifts to the church for a purpose. It says, for the edification of the body of Christ. So that they can do the work of the ministry. As leaders, we think we are in ministry doing the work. But our job is to equip the body to do. So, integrity, servanthood, and empowerment. Those will be three key words. So thank you very much, Dr. Akiemi. We are really, you know, inspired by what you have just shared with us. Uh, thank you that you, take, you took this time out of a very busy schedule to be with us. Uh, we wish you a safe trip to East London. And regards to your family. Thank you. Bye-bye.